very happy to have, I think, the record of posters at the STP school. But this also implies that uh, we trust that you guys are very disciplined and really help us arranging them properly. Okay? So it's important that we are able to put two posters for each side of each board. Okay? So if two posters are in zero, they do not fit by roughly 20 centimeters. So the thing that you have to do, you have to fix your poster in the middle and try and you will have 10 centimeters outside. So we should, we should not get that. If your poster is A1, it's no problem at all. If your poster is A0, but oriented this way, this is really problematic. So search for a partner that has an A1 or A2 poster. Okay? Otherwise, it's very hard. I mean, given these rules, we, uh, we should be able to put all the eight posters up. Uh, so, uh, please be collaborative, and if, if you have already fixed your posters upstairs, and it's not according to these rules, please do that over the lunch break, so that people have space to, for their own posters. Okay, with that, we start with the second lecture of the morning. <coughs> so, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to continue in this lecture the theme that I started yesterday, uh, talking about um, systems which have uh, macroscopically many degrees of freedom, but constraints amongst them. So as uh, you remember, um, I started out using the largest part of the lecture yesterday to talk about this example of the triangular lattice antiferromagnet. And we saw how, uh, well, firstly, degeneracy could arise in a reasonably realistic uh, interacting system, uh, in fact, as a result of frustration. Uh, and then we saw how you could get a long-distance description of the system, which uh, I, I think is certainly much simpler, by um, mapping configurations onto a height field and that mapping can be done uh, exactly at a mic microscopic level, uh, but having got this uh, more convenient degree of freedom to describe the system, that's to say the height field in place of the spins, uh, we could then start making approximations uh, and go to a coarse-grained continuum description of the system. And um, then we have to check a few things, such as the relevance of cosine terms that might pin the height to integer values, but uh, provided uh, just the uh, leading uh, grad h squared term is uh, relevant, then we have a rather simple description, which allows us, for example, to understand power law correlations, and also allows us to go further. Although the uh, height mapping was developed initially for uh, ground states of the system, therefore to describe zero temperature properties, if we go to non-zero temperature, then uh, we introduce defects into the system, but if the temperature is low on the scale of the exchange interaction, then these defects are dilute, and you have large regions of the system between the defects which can be described by the height model, and uh, we can uh, capture the entropic interaction between defects uh, by doing calculations in the height model. And then, uh, depending on the stiffness parameter, you may either find that these defects, which you can think of as vortices in the same sense as in the uh, XY model and the KT transition, uh, if the uh, stiffness is small enough, then the vortices are unbound. And that gives you uh, exponentially decaying correlations at long distances, um, which is the case in the spin half model at, at finite temperature. So then I started talking about diamond models, and I'll continue with that uh, during this lecture. And then at the end of this lecture and in the lecture this afternoon, I'll talk about a class of magnetic materials that goes under the name spin ice which is probably the best realization that we have uh, in a concrete material of uh, the physics that I'm talking about. Um, so the end point of the lecture yesterday is this slide. And the overall idea was that 
if we think in the dimer language, then we can use dimers to specify the uh, strength of a flux on links of the lattice. And this flux um, is divergence-free uh, at the microscopic level. And so again, it's a suitable quantity to use when we construct a coarse-grained description of the system. And um, we can think of uh, a divergence-free flux, of course, uh, as coming from the curl of a vector potential. And if we want to use that idea in two dimensions and use a conventional three-dimensional curl, then we can say that we have a three-component vector potential, which is in the uh, z direction and with a size given by a height field, which is just, in fact, the height field that we were talking about before, uh, because then the uh, flux strength uh, is the gradient of the height field. And uh, we get back to this effective description on the basis that uh, if we have large values of the flux, then we have low entropy. And so in these effective theories, we should uh, penalize those microscopic configurations. And uh, in three dimensions, we have something similar. We can construct an effective weight for configurations uh, in terms of the, uh, an integral over the flux density in the configuration. And the main difference between uh, the two-dimensional theory and the three-dimensional theory is that in two dimensions, uh, the fact that the height field is uh, microscopically um, discrete uh, can, if the uh, stiffness is large enough, give you uh, a crystalline phase where the height locks uniformly to an integer value. But in three dimensions, there are no small perturbations uh, of this theory that uh, uh, relevant in the RG sense. So what I want to do next is talk about calculating uh, correlation functions uh, starting from, from this point. Are there any questions which I should answer before I get going? Yeah. Uh, well, well, firstly, you, you say if the ground state is the uh, zero flux state, uh, I mean, I think I'd like to emphasize that in these problems, we have many configurations which all have the same energy. So in the uh, dimer problems, we have macroscopically many allowed dimer configurations. And uh, if we do a statistical average, we should take account of all of those. And it's only after we've done some coarse graining that we say that the configurations that, in a coarse grain sense, have lower values of this flux B are the ones with more uh, microscopic entropy. Uh, so uh, you know, by that argument, what we want to do is suppress configurations with large values of B and it's B itself rather than its gradient that matters. That's, I mean, that's why it's not gradient of B. Um, I, I mean, I, I had some pictures which are on the previous set of slides, but for example, if I have a dimer configuration which is like this, then it translates to a large flux. And what's more, there's no way of locally reorganizing these dimers. Uh, so it's got a small entropy, whereas a configuration which is like this has lots of possible local reorganizations. Uh, and what's more, this turns out to be high flux, and this is a low flux. So it's for that sort of reason that you penalize flux itself rather than the gradient. 
Okay, so what I want to start with is a calculation of the correlation functions of the flux here. Um, and so obviously that's likely to be uh, somewhat analogous to the calculation that I did yesterday of spin-spin uh, correlation functions. Um, if it were completely the same, I, I wouldn't simply repeat it. Uh, and the difference is that um, when we talked about mapping from the height field back to spins in the triangular lattice uh, antiferromagnet, um, the argument was that the spins are given by a periodic function of the height field, and uh, in the leading approximation, you just take the uh, lowest Fourier component, which was this cosine. And for that reason, what we had to average was the exponential of i times a constant times the height field. Uh, what I want to talk about calculating averages of now is uh, components of this B field. Um, so what we want to calculate is an average of um, one component of the B field at the origin and a possibly different component of the B field at some point R uh, with uh, the average meaning um, a functional integral over B uh, with this effective Hamiltonian as a weight, and the effective Hamiltonian is um, some microscopic stiffness times the integral of the flux density. So the first point to make is that um, the fact that this B field is constrained to have zero divergence is absolutely essential in having the possibility of a non-trivial answer here. Because if you did a calculation like this, but where B was completely unconstrained, then uh, the Bs at different points in the functional integral would be independent of each other, and this would just be uh, some delta function on R. Um, so uh, what we want to do is impose the constraint that div B is zero, and of course there's more than one way of doing that. One way would be to uh, express B in terms of the uh, vector potential and switch the integration variables to the vector potential. Uh, and another possibility, which is the one that I'll follow, is to put in some penalty in the weight for having a non-zero divergence and uh, take the limit at the end of the calculation uh, of uh, infinite value for this uh, parameter which suppresses things. Um, so if we do Fourier transforms, um, we can talk about Fourier components And we have the inverse transform um, so if we use Fourier transforms, we diagonalize the uh, effective Hamiltonian and um, what we have then is a sum over the Fourier modes um, and the spin components or the field components um, and um, then as the weight 
from this term, we just have uh, unity in the space of components. And here we have something to impose this constraint, so plus mu. And if I think of the action of divergence on uh, B, then, of course, the gradient just brings down uh, a Q. Um, so what I have is, uh, if I'm thinking about spin, uh, field components I and J, what I have is uh, QI, QJ. Um, and it's useful to be clear about what we've got here and to see what we've really got, it's convenient to take out the length squared of this vector and I can write it as mu times q squared and then qi qj over q squared. Uh, and that's in fact a projection operator. So I can think of this projection operator as being qi qj over q squared. And to convince yourself that it's a projection operator, well, projection operators square to themselves, and uh, it's one line of algebra to see that's the case. Um, OK, so then we want to calculate the uh, correlator. And firstly, it's zero if the Fourier components are different from each other. Um, and then what we've got from doing the Gaussian integral is uh, 1 over k times the inverse of um, that kernel to the weight. So we need to take the inverse of um, 1 plus mu q squared p, and then we take the ijth entry. And thinking of things in terms of a projection operator, I think, makes it easy to see what the inverse of this is. Um, what you get is uh, a piece which is just 1 minus the projection operator and another piece which involves this uh, Lagrange multiplier that's going to keep the divergence 0. And uh, that's 1 plus mu q squared times uh, And then the point is that um, when we take the limit and fix the divergence of B to be 0, then uh, because mu is on the bottom, uh, this term goes away. And uh, what we've got is something that's proportional to uh, delta ij minus uh, qi qj on q squared. So. What you see from that is that um, there's some kind of non-analytic behavior at uh, q equals 0, uh, because depending on which direction you approach q equals 0, once you've picked on components i and j, you uh, get different, different values. Um, well, that's the correlator in reciprocal space. Uh, but what we'd like to do is understand the implications in real space. Uh, and so if we go back in the Fourier transform, then um, we have 
the Fourier transform of this correlator. Um, and then there's also a 1 over k. Um, and all the uh, interest comes from the behavior of the Fourier transform of this term. And a convenient way of doing the integral, if I turn this into 1 over 2 pi cubed integral over q, uh, a convenient way of uh, doing this is to uh, think of the integral of e to the i q dot r and take derivatives with respect to uh, components of r in order to bring down these uh, factors. So we have uh, 1 over k and d2 by d r i d r j of, um, and then as far as this term is concerned, it's uh, minus 1 over q squared times e to the i q dot r. Um, Uh, I'm missing a mu. Uh, well, I took mu to infinity, which killed this term. And so what I'm dealing with is this term. And what I'm saying is, in fact, this uh, first contribution is not the important one. Uh, the interesting long distance behavior comes from this term because of its singularity. Um, and um, So the Fourier transform of 1 over q squared gives me uh, just 1 over r. So what I have finally is um, d2 by d r i r j of 1 over r. And if I evaluate the derivatives, then I get um, 3 r i r j minus r squared over r to the fifth. And if I'm careful and put back the prefactors, then it uh, goes like 1 over k. So uh, if we stop and look at this result, we can compare it with what we had in the triangular lattice Ising model. And um, there are some similarities, but also some differences. So uh, the first point is that um, whereas in the Ising model we had a power law of one half, um, which we saw later on would vary continuously with the sniffness in the height model, uh, here we've got a fixed power. Uh, it's basically 1 over r cubed, uh, regardless of the value of the stiffness. Um, and um, we've also got an interesting angular dependence, which is basically the angular dependence that you have in the dipolar interaction. And I'll come back uh, later to uh, some consequences of that. Um, so uh, any questions about the calculation. As, sorry, should I write the final result up higher up so that it's easier to see? Uh, so the result was 3 ri rj minus r squared over r to the fifth four uh, the for, for the correlator that we had originally. OK, um, so in other words, we, we've done a parallel calculation for the three-dimensional system to the one that uh, we had of spin correlations in the uh, two-dimensional system. And what I want to do now is go back to Dimer models and uh, talk about other aspects of their properties. Um, and uh, 
so the first aspect that I want to talk about is the analog for dimer models of the possibility in the uh, triangular lattice antiferromagnet of introducing excitations out of the ground state. Now, in the Ising model, we started with a statistical mechanics problem with uh, some energy scale, and we got our constrained set of states by going to the ground states. Uh, in dimer problems, you don't initially have any kind of energy scale. You just have this way of constructing allowed configurations with uh, dimers on links and uh, exactly one dimer touching each site. Uh, but we can go in the same direction if we allow ourselves to break up a couple of di uh, a few dimers into pairs of monomers, and then we consider configurations of the system uh, with uh, monomers um, arranged uh, in particular places. And presumably, the interesting situation is going to be when the uh, concentration of monomers is low. And uh, so let's focus on what happens if we have a single monomer in a dimer configuration. So um, our basis for talking about dimer configurations was this uh, mapping from dimer configurations onto fluxes, which involved, first of all, uh, taking a convention for the orientation of links from, uh, say, sublattice A towards sublattice B, uh, and then uh, associating uh, a flux with each link uh, with a value and a sign that depends on whether there's a dimer present or not. So in a situation where we have a monomer here, that means that we have four links around uh, a site with uh, no dimer on, and that means that they all carry flux in the same uh, direction relative to the site. And uh, so we see in the right-hand picture that the monomer acts as a source of flux. And if I place the monomer on the opposite sublattice, then the links would have been directed in the other direction. Uh, that's to say towards the site where the monomer is. Uh, and uh, in that case, we'd have had uh, a, a, a sink of flux. Um, So then we can ask about the entropic interactions uh, that we have between monomers. So that's to say we can uh, think of placing uh, a pair of monomers in the system at two fixed sites and uh, ask about the entropy of uh, the configurations of the dimer background uh, as a function of the separation between the two monomers. Uh, yes, question. Um, no, they're, they're something that we introduce. So uh, before you decide that you'd like to study monomers, then um, you might just stick with a rule that uh, you can only consider dimer coverings of the lattice, which have exactly one dimer touching every site, and, and then there's no possibility of, of monomers. So it's a conscious choice to break that rule and to investigate the consequences of breaking it. Um, OK, so then we ask uh, what the entropic interaction is between a pair of monomers. And, and that means something very concrete. We put monomers down at a given separation, and we count the number of dimer configurations that there are for that separation. And then we vary the separation and see how the number of uh, dimer configurations varies with separation. So that gives us an entropy as a function of separation, and that's what we're computing. And the idea is that this continuum effective theory uh, can tell us what that entropy is. Uh, and 
I haven't actually put any explicit calculations because uh, the results of the calculations that you do are familiar to you uh, from electromagnetism. So the point is that if we put a pair of dimers, one on the A sublattice and one on the B sublattice, they're a source and a sink of this flux. So if you like, you can think of them as positively and negatively uh, charged uh, electric charges. And when we do this calculation of the entropy, what we're asking for is the, um, in the electrostatic analogy, uh, we're asking for the energy of the electric field between the uh, two uh, charges. And um, in other words, we're asking for the interaction potential in electrostatics. So uh, in three dimensions, uh, you know that the interaction potential goes like 1 over r. And uh, we, we start with some uh, attractive interaction uh, for opposite charges uh, when they're close together. And so we, we have uh, some value of R that corresponds to the lattice spacing. And the crucial thing is that uh, if we separate the uh, charges to infinity, we only have to uh, pay uh, a finite amount of uh, electrostatic energy or uh, in the analogy, uh, entropy, uh, and so in three dimensions, these charge pairs are unbound. In two-dimensional electrostatics, because uh, the electric field due to a point charge falls off in two dimensions like 1 over r rather than 1 over r squared, if we integrate that up, we get a potential uh, that varies logarithmically instead of as 1 over r with separation, and uh, so we, we have uh, a logarithmic entropic binding potential, and uh, as I explained yesterday, we should then uh, see how that plays off with the increased entropy uh, from uh, different positions to uh, put the charges as you separate them, uh, and if the uh, coefficient here is small enough, uh, then uh, charges uh, are unbound, um, and uh, on the other hand, if it's large, then charges can be bound in pairs. So, any questions about that? Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I didn't get the question. Um, yeah, this is quite a long way from quantization. I mean, we're really, uh, well, we're, we're, we're strictly in three dimensions rather than three plus one dimensions. Uh, so I think it's a formal analogy. I, I mean, I can talk more afterwards, but. Um, so there's one caveat to that idea that in three dimensions or, or in two dimensions, if the stiffness is small enough, uh, monopoles, uh, m uh, monomers are, are unbound from each other. And uh, the caveat is that it's crucial that the background of dimers in between the monomers is in a liquid-like state and not in a crystalline state. So, I mean, I explained that um, if the stiffness is large enough, then uh, that can lead the height field to lock, and that corresponds to uh, the dimers ordering in some kind of crystalline pattern. And if we start with a crystalline pattern and then uh, break up one of these dimers into two monomers and shuffle the dimers around to separate the monomers, then what happens when we do that is that we leave a clear string behind uh, along the line on which we've separated the two monomers and uh, because we can 
identify this visually when we look at the configuration, uh, we can expect that there'll be uh, an entropy penalty associated with this string, which is proportional to the length. And so instead of having uh, an entropic potential that grows logarithmically with separation in two dimensions or goes like one over r in three dimensions, uh, if we have uh, a crystalline background, we can expect a potential that increases linearly and therefore uh, binds uh, pairs of monomers uh, rather strongly. Well, this is a limitation of drawing cartoons, but uh, suppose you have uh, a situation um, in two dimensions where the uh, stiffness of the height field is just bigger than the critical value, uh, so that the height field is relevant, but only relevant at, at long scale, sorry, so that the discreteness of the height field is relevant on long scales, then the um, configurations that you'll get will not be as rigid as this, but they'll have some average order, but with fluctuations around the order. So there'll be uh, a finite entropy density, but also an order parameter. And it's how that finite entropy density is affected by the uh, pair of monomers that I'm talking about. Thanks. OK, um, you can also go back to the triangular lattice problem and think of the mapping from uh, spin configurations to dimers and check how this idea of uh, monomers uh, fits in with what we were talking about there. And the answer turns out to be, uh, to some extent it fits, but to some extent it's a slightly different idea. So uh, in the context of the triangular lattice, the idea you remember was that if we uh, have uh, a pair of spins in a triangle which are parallel to each other, then uh, in the mapping to a dimer configuration, we place a dimer on the corresponding bond of the hexagonal lattice. So now we should see what that rule uh, means if we have uh, a triangle that's excited out of the ground state so that all three spins are parallel. Well, clearly what that means is that on the site of the hexagonal lattice, which is at the center of this triangle, there are dimers uh, arranged on all of the three hexagonal lattice uh, bonds that uh, go outwards from that site. So uh, the spin excitations correspond to having uh, sites of the hexagonal lattice, not with one dimer touching them, but with uh, three dimers touching them. And uh, you can see that this will uh, give you sources and sinks of flux, but in a slightly more elaborate way than the uh, monomers that I was talking about. So in the context of the um, hexagonal lattice dimer model, we can introduce monomers, uh, but these don't have any uh, correspondence back in the um, Ising model language. OK, so there's one final point which uh, uh, I want to make about uh, this type of dimer model. And it's the uh, analog or the extension uh, of the point that I made um, about uh, sectors of states in the uh, triangular lattice antiferromagnet. So the point there uh, was that um, if we consider ground state configurations that satisfy, say, periodic boundary conditions on a torus, uh, the fact that the spins satisfy periodic boundary conditions doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, height variables will satisfy periodic boundary conditions. And um, as I explained yesterday, uh, the boundary conditions on the height fields are that uh, they have to match modulo uh, six in both directions around the torus. So you can have configurations with a tilt to them. Um, and uh, there are uh, 
analogous ideas that apply in these uh, Daimler models. So the first point I want to make is that if we take a Daimler configuration and ask about the flux uh, crossing uh, a line through the system or uh, a line in two dimensions or uh, a surface if we're thinking about a three-dimensional model, then uh, that flux is conserved in the sense that it doesn't matter where you locate the line. We'll calculate the same flux across the red dotted line as we will across the green dotted line. And you can convince yourself that that's true. Uh, across this green line, we've got uh, three units of flux going down and three units of flux going up. Uh, so those cancel. And then on these two, we've got four units of flux in the upward direction altogether. And uh, if we look at things across the red line, then again, we've got four units of flux upwards here. And again, we've got a cancellation, but a different cancellation uh, on the two leftmost links. Um, that was just one example, but you can convince yourself more generally that uh, nothing that we do with local rearrangements of dimers can change the uh, flux crossing uh, one of these uh, hypersurfaces. So, for example, uh, you can uh, start with this top picture and think about rearranging the dimers on this green loop. And um, the loop is chosen so that uh, on alternate steps, it crosses a dimer and then crosses an empty bond and then crosses a dimer and so on. And that means that uh, you can rearrange the dimers on the loop, uh, moving the uh, dimers from the occupied to the empty bonds. And uh, if you do that with this loop, then uh, you'll switch uh, from this bond that goes across the cut uh, being occupied, and similarly with this one being occupied. But um, if you check things out, you'll find that this link is going is in, in the convention for directing the links from one sublattice to the other, this uh, link has one direction relative to the cut and the other link has the opposite direction. And so uh, the contributions to the flux from these two dimers cancels and uh, that remains true whether they're both occupied or both unoccupied. Uh, and um, alternatively, if you uh, find uh, a, a loop which um, crosses two bonds that uh, are directed in the same sense, then uh, on these bipartite lattices, you always find that uh, in the initial configuration, uh, one of the links is empty and the other is occupied by a dimer, and that remains true if I shuffle the dimers around the loop. So whatever rearrangements I make of dimers around uh, local loops, uh, I can't change the uh, flux cutting uh, any of these hypersurfaces around the system. So what that means is that we can separate the uh, configurations of dimer models uh, according to the values of the flux, uh, and in D dimensions we'd have uh, fluxes uh, around uh, all D directions on the uh, hypertorus. Um, and uh, you can't get from uh, one sector to another just by making local rearrangements of the dimers. Uh, so any, any questions? I mean, I've got a bit more to explain on, on this slide, but any questions so far? So, um, if you want to get between sectors, then uh, one way of doing things is to break a dimer up into uh, a, a pair of monomers. Um, and uh, then, because they're initially on different sublattices, they correspond to uh, charges with opposite signs. And uh, if you um, then make dimer uh, rearrangements locally, you can eventually move uh, one of the charges right around the torus, 
And if you then bring the two monomers together, you can recombine them into a dimer. And in the process of doing that, what you've done is uh, uh, arrange for an extra flux line to thread around the torus, and that gets you uh, between um, one uh, sector and another. Um, so one thing that you can get from this height model description is an understanding of what the fluctuations ought to be in the fluxes winding around the torus uh, if you average over all these different sectors. Um, and the result is easy to work out and useful to see. So I'll do it, calculate it now. So the point is that um, if we want to describe configurations of the flux in this coarse-grained way, uh, in the presence of some uh, average flux winding around the torus, then we can split B into something which um, has no net flux and uh, then the average. And if I have a flux winding around the torus, uh, which I write as phi, then the flux density will in D dimensions be like that. And uh, so if I take this decomposition and put it into the statistical weight that we're using, then uh, I get, obviously, a contribution involving delta B squared, and uh, then something involving uh, pi squared. And the coefficient here, uh, since this is a constant, it'll be the square of this uh, 1 over L to the D minus 1 times the volume of the system from the integral. Uh, so that will give us uh, 2 minus D as the prefactor. And then you might think that you'd have a, a cross term, um, but uh, if you have um, net flux zero, then that, that averages to zero. Um, so the point is that uh, this gives you a statistical weight for uh, fluctuations in the uh, flux between sectors. And uh, what you see is that um, phi squared average varies with system size like uh, L to the uh, D minus 2. So in two dimensions, this is an order one quantity. And when it's an order one quantity, the fact that microscopically it's actually discrete valued uh, becomes important. And uh, then we get back to the relevance of the cosine terms that uh, I talked about in detail yesterday. But if we're in three dimensions, then uh, the fluctuations in the flux grow with uh, system size. And then uh, the fact that we're fluctuating through integer values rather than uh, fluctuating uh, through uh, a set of real values uh, becomes unimportant in a large system. And that's how you see that the discreteness of the flux at a microscopic level is, is not important in uh, three-dimensional systems. So any, any questions? OK, so the next topic that I want to talk about is what difference it makes, what type of lattice you define your dimer model on. And um, in the examples I've talked about so far, the lattice was bipartite. So a lot of my pictures were drawn for uh, a square lattice. And the lattice that I arrived at, starting from the 
triangular lattice sizing model was a hexagonal one, and both of those are bipartite. And the fact that they were bipartite was crucial in the way that I went from dimer configurations to uh, a definition of fluxes that I could coarse grain. So uh, you would expect things to change a lot when you go to a non-bipartite lattice, and uh, indeed they do. Um, so um, when we go to a non-bipartite lattice and ask what's uh, conserved or whether there's anything that's conserved when we shuffle dimers uh, around loops, it turns out that there is something simpler that's conserved, and that's just the parity of the number of dimers cutting a particular line. So, uh, for example, uh, suppose you uh, start with this configuration, and then you pick out the dimers lying under this blue line, and uh, again, I've selected a path on the lattice where the links alternately go over a dimer and over an empty bond, and that means that I can make a rearrangement of the dimers on this blue line, uh, switching the dimers to the empty bonds and leaving the occupied bonds empty. And clearly, if I do that, then uh, I'll change the number of dimers cutting this uh, red dash line by two, and so I leave the uh, parity unchanged. And uh, you can think about uh, other examples. Uh, so here, uh, I've, I've chosen things uh, differently. Um, but again, if I move the dimers uh, around, uh, I'll uh, leave the parity of the number of dimers crossing uh, the dashed line uh, unchanged. Uh, so what this means is that um, the set of configurations is still separated on a torus into uh, disconnected sectors, but now the number of sectors is uh, much smaller. So um, in the bipartite case, the sectors were labeled by these total fluxes, uh, which had integer values uh, ranging up to uh, something uh, of order the size of the uh, cross-section of the system. Um, here, uh, the uh, sectors are, are labeled, but just by the parity of the number of dimers crossing a line in each of the uh, directions uh, encircling the torus. So in D dimensions, we have two to the D sectors, or if you took uh, a, 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 a surface or hypersurface to embed the model on, uh, with some uh, more general genus, then uh, you'd have uh, two to the uh, genus uh, disconnected sectors. Um, so you can also ask the other questions that you would, uh, that we've talked about uh, in connection with diamond models uh, for these um, non-bipartite lattices. And in particular, you can ask about what the uh, entropic interaction is between uh, monomers. And uh, what you find, well, firstly, dimer correlations uh, on these non-bipartite lattices uh, are generically uh, short-ranged rather than uh, giving you these uh, power law correlations. So they decay uh, exponentially. And in turn, that means that you just have uh, short-ranged entropic interactions uh, between monomers, uh, provided you don't pick some model where uh, the dimers are ordered into some uh, crystalline state. So uh, any questions on that? Um, right, uh, so uh, you have to do a proper calculation, of course, uh, to get that. Uh, and um, in two dimensions, like a lot of other classical statistical mechanics problems in two dimensions, uh, these Dimer models uh, are generically exactly solvable. And um, there are um, Grassmann variable techniques for uh, calculating uh, 
uh, the entropy and the correlation functions and so on. So you have to do a, a concrete calculation. Uh, in three dimensions, you, you can't do exact calculations, but uh, of course you can do Monte Carlo simulations and uh, you can measure the correlation functions in simulations. Okay, so um, that's probably a good point to stop because I want to move on uh, next to an entirely new topic, uh, which is about these uh, magnetic materials that realize Coulomb phases. Uh, so maybe I can stop there. Thank you.